Good morning, and welcome back to Global Neurosciences Institute Grand Round Series. I hope it, everybody had a great summer. I can promise that Grand Rounds this year will be very exciting as we have a great lineup of speakers, not only from GNI, but also from many national and international institutions. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker uh, this year, Dr. Adam Sarkar. Um, Dr. Sarkar became a national recognized Westinghouse Science Scholar prior to attending Brown University as an undergraduate. During this time, he investigated issues related to viral oncology at various institutions, including Ludwig Institute of Cancer Research in Switzerland, as well as Rockefeller University and the University of Georgia. Dr. Sarkar received his MD PhD degrees from the University of Miami School of Medicine. His PhD dissertation was conducted in the Department of Physiology and Biophysics with a focus on molecular neuroscience. This work culminated in cloning and characterizing neuropeptide receptors from the brain and earned research distinction from the graduate school. It was at Miami that an interest in neurosurgery was galvanized and Dr. Starker completed his neurosurgery residency at the Mayo Clinic. Dr. Sarker's first faculty appointment was at the Ohio State University Department of Neurological Surgery. He joined Global Neurosciences Institute in January of 2019 as a neurosurgeon and is a professor in the Department of Neurosurgery at Drexel University College of Medicine. Dr. Sarker serves as a director of stereotactic, functional, and epilepsy surgery program, as well as tumor surgery program for Global Neurosciences Institute. And Dr. Sarker will be speaking today about malignant gliomas. Dr. Sarkar. First of all, thank you for the opportunity to speak and have the, uh, the inaugural uh, uh, kickoff for the 2021-2022 lecture series. I'd like to talk about uh, malignant gliomas, uh, and I don't want to uh, get too locked into statistics and alphabet soup of molecular biology. Uh, but I'd like to give a more broader perspective, if you would, and I would like to also uh, share some of the work that we're doing, both work that I've done in the past and work that we're doing here in Philadelphia uh, at Drexel and also with other uh, regional institutional partners. So as Peter mentioned, uh, I am very, very fortunate to enjoy a bunch of different roles at uh, uh, GNI. And in addition to some of those roles uh, at Drexel University, I have, great, I have great wonderful research partners as uh, my uh, co-appointments are in pharmacology and physiology, as well as the School of Biomedical Engineering. I'm going to take a moment to uh, just sort of like reflect personally. And uh, this is a, a slide. Uh, this picture right here on the left, uh, my dad, my mom, and I came from uh, India and landed in uh, Philadelphia in 1967. And at that point in time, my dad joined an institution called the Institute of Medical Research in Camden, New Jersey. And so we lived in Collingswood. And my dad was looking at uh, problems that had to do with breast cancer. And he was trying to come up with a model for breast cancer, which was a virus-based model for mouse mammary tumor virus as a model for human breast cancer. And so I've always had uh, in me this notion of uh, tumor biology uh, through my dad. And uh, I have to say that through all my travels, as Peter sort of implied, I've uh, been around the United States getting my education. And then when this opportunity to come back to this area uh, was afforded to me, it was with a, a great deal of enthusiasm and delight that I took it. And you can see now, 50 years uh, later, this is uh, me with my kids. And uh, we were at the Coriel Institute for Medical Research, which was the uh, actual place where my dad uh, joined uh, 50 years uh, prior. So it's a little bit of a wonderful nostalgia and an opportunity to continue on with the science that he uh, initiated here in this region and science that we hope at Global Neuroscience, we continue to advance. I'm going to talk about neurosurgery uh, for brain tumors in particular very soon, but I just want to give a perspective that ever since we've come together as human societies, meaning in the Neolithic about uh, nine or 10,000 years ago, brain surgery, whether it was intended to be surgery or more mystical and spiritual, it was being done. This is a picture that I use frequently from somebody who was trephined, meaning had a surgery on the back of their, uh, on their skull. 
and survived. And this is from over 7,000 years ago. And we know that at least 5,000 years ago, the first documented surgical treatise called the Edwin Smith uh, Surgical Papyrus uh, was found in Egypt. And this image that I'm showing right here, this image is the brain. This is the first time the brain was ever depicted in writing. And I think that it just goes to show you that neuroscience, whether it was for intended scientific purposes or not, the brain, the skull, the calvarium have all been fascinations for humans throughout. And you can see that that not only exists in uh, the Middle East and in Europe, but also this is, if you ever get the chance to go to Peru and go to the Alarco Museum, you can see these uh, skulls uh, uh, displayed at the Alarco and you can see this trephine in the back this must have been quite some uh, operation in order to get this uh, patient to survive because as all of my neurosurgical colleagues will know, that hole is placed at the torcula, which is probably the worst and venous spot to put something because one little problem and there's a big bad outcome. These are the uh, equipments that they would use uh, back then, these uh, ways of scraping away at the bone. And I can only imagine what kind of anesthesia they used to hold down this patient. Fascination for uh, the head and the brain uh, also extends uh, to Mesoamerica. This is uh, at the museum uh, in the uh, Palacio Nacional in uh, Mexico City. And you can see that people were not only fascinated with the brain in life, but also clearly they were fascinated with the brain uh, in the afterlife. Now let's switch gears. Let's come to modern day uh, surgery. I think many of um, the public think of neurosurgeons and surgeons in general as taking a problem and removing it. And uh, for sure, when somebody shows up with this disc herniation, which I think you might be able to see here, the C67 disc herniation, we can easily go in and we can repair that mechanical problem and fix them. And equally, when it comes to tumors, uh, this is a colloid cyst of the third ventricle that was periodically occluding what was uh, what's called the outflow tract uh, of the cerebrospinal fluid. And we can take that discrete lesion out. Uh, here's a view in the intraoperative uh, uh, setting. And postoperatively, it can look as if we were almost never there. And not only can we deal with, uh, uh, you know, phys physical barriers or physical lesions uh, like in the uh, third ventricle that are small, we can deal with very large uh, lesions like this sphenoid wing meningioma, this uh, almost over seven centimeters, take them out and patients do just fine. Uh, and, and I think that's really, really amazing uh, and something that we do as surgeons quite well. But here's something that I'd like to uh, start the discussion about gliomas and really kick off uh, this uh, discussion about brain tumors. And that is, there's a tumor here it's, I've uh, false highlighted it in red. And if you look at this MRI scan, I've also false highlighted it in red here on this axial study. And that tumor seems fairly distinct. It seems fairly discreet. It seems like, oh, okay, wow, you've put dots around it. So that's clearly where the tumor is. And in the post-operative study, which is down below here, uh, you can see that the ventricular system, which I've outlined in this instance in uh, yellow, uh, looks like it's now in a more normal position than in the slide of, in the picture above it. And you don't see that sort of uh, uh, craggy appearance uh, that was in that left uh, parietal occipital lobe. And you might say, wow, that's awesome. That's great. And uh, this patient must be cured because you've taken their tumor out. But that is really uh, only the tip of the iceberg. Uh, we found out for the last, and we have known for almost 100 years, actually even longer than that, that Glioblastomas, and historically, all brain tumors were just called gliomas. There wasn't as defined a classification. But ultimately, what we will talk about are glioblastomas. And at the end of the talk, I'll also extend that to an even more nuanced version of how we can talk about gliomas and what the differences are. But in uh, 1949, so almost 70 years ago, or more than 70 years ago, uh, a group at the Mayo Clinic, um, Dr. Kernahan is a pathologist, started defining and classifying gliomas and saying, well, not all gliomas are the same. And that's of course, uh, probably a no brainer, so to speak. And at that point in time, the worst gliomas, which were called um, glioblastoma multiformes, uh, were seen to have a survival expectancy of really only about anywhere from six to eight months. And this was really quite dismal. Um, if you, 
compare that to what we have today, it's really not that much better. I think um, many of us who are neurosurgeons really say that this is one of the uh, sort of shocking uh, um, sort of embarrassments in tumor biology that in seven decades, we've only improved survival probably at best by a month for each decade of research, which is a really paltry sort of uh, rate of uh, discovery. Here's a paper that is uh, almost 100 years old. This is a classification of gliomas by uh, Percival uh, Bailey and Harvey Cushing. Harvey Cushing for all neurosurgeons is this incredible luminary. And Percival Bailey is actually a, a neurosurgeon who came uh, to neurosurgery almost uh, by accident. He was a very talented medical student studying in Chicago and uh, I believe it was Chicago. And he sent out two letters. He was fascinated in neuroscience and he sent a letter to the most prominent neurosurgeon of the day, which was Harvey Cushing, and to the most prominent psychiatrist of the day. I forget which that psychiatrist was. And Cushing responded first. So Bailey packed up his bags and headed to uh, Cushing's lab. And Cushing gave him this project. Cushing was meticulous. He kept uh, incredible records. He kept uh, uh, specimens and samples. And uh, he set out to give uh, Bailey 400 glioma specimens, of which there were about 200 had histo, uh, Bailey did uh, the uh, uh, histology on. And they came up with a classification system almost 100 years ago. And that's where you can see here, it's not the best uh, uh, slide to see it, but they basically broke down the nervous system into its component parts. And they said, okay, well, if you have ependymas, there are ependymomas. If you have, um, uh, if you have tumors of the covering of uh, nerve cells, uh, oligodendro or the, uh, um, the, the, the glial covering of the oligodendroglials, uh, then you'll have an oligodendroglioma. If you have a, a astrocytic tumor, you could have astrocytomas. The glioblastomas were really confusing them because they were so bizarre in their shape that they called them glioblastoma multiforme because they had so many different forms. There was no one particular uh, homogenizing thing that brought them all together. And I'll show you that as we get uh, further into this uh, slide discussion. Uh, but that was incredible. And Cushing's uh, uh, group, uh, he had uh, a survival estimate of about 10 months for the high-grade gliomas. And I think that that's, um, that's probably a tribute to Cushing as a surgeon. Um, but again, these are uh, numbers that haven't improved uh, incredibly uh, well in these last uh, 100 years or seven, uh, 70 years since um, Kernahan. I want to get uh, something clear. When we talk about brain tumors, there are clearly two different characters of brain tumors. We have tumors that have come from somewhere else and uh, into the nervous system, into the CNS, or we have tumors that start fundamentally in the CNS and they're elements of the uh, central nervous system. Some of them are considered intraaxial, like uh, gliomas, and some of them are considered extraaxial, like what we call meningiomas, because they come from the coverings uh, of the uh, uh, elements of the dura or the uh, leptomeninges. I don't want to get people bogged down in numbers and that's why I'm not using any here, but fundamentally, if you look here, the incidence of um, metastatic tumors is much higher than primary brain tumors. As a matter of fact, if you do need to put a number down, there are about 200,000 uh, metastatic lesions that will happen in cancer patients in any given year. Uh, this represents about 20% um, of all cancer patients having metastatic lesions that go to the brain. On the other hand, glioblastomas might only represent about 15 to 20,000 patients a year. And while that doesn't sound so awful, the awful thing is that these tumors are indeed just that, they're awful. Um, I would like to point out that uh, Glioblastomas are not the most common primary brain tumor, but meningiomas are more common, but glioblastomas do account for at least 50% of all glial tumors. And that means the elements of the brain, meaning allodendroglials, astrocytomas, 
and uh, ependymomas. And that's in part why it's also highlighted here with a slightly bigger text than, say, ependymomas or uh, lymphomas or oligodendrogliomas. Here is a really, really dramatic slide. Uh, I talked about uh, Harvey Cushing. Uh, this is Walter Dandy. Uh, the two have a relationship that is um, not uh, in, one was a, a, as a mentorship at one point in time, uh, Dandy being a student of Cushing, and then as competitors. So here is a retrospective of 10 patients that Walter Dandy operated on. These are glioma patients. And uh, any of the surgeons would uh, quickly understand that, my goodness, this is a lot of brain. And that's exactly what he did. They felt that gliomas were so awful that doing a hemispherectomy, literally taking out half of the brain was the only way to cure them. In this situation, what Dandy would do is he would do a, in an appropriate patient or what he felt was an appropriate patient, a right-sided hemispherectomy, in other words, to keep usually typically dominant language function preserved and a dominant hand function also preserved. And he did this in a few patients. It would, of course, uh, induce uh, hemiparesis on the left side. But unfortunately, these patients would then undergo uh, or succumb uh, to their uh, GBM disease because gliomas are migratory. And I'll show you that in, in, in actually uh, real uh, videos, but gliomas are migratory. And then it was really quickly realized that my goodness, even a dramatic operation like taking out half the brain was still not enough to combat gliomas. Hmm, somehow, okay, here's my next slide. And this is actually a slide from my lab from almost 15 years ago. Uh, in the background, you can see uh, these uh, beautifully uh, red stained cells with blue nuclei. This is, uh, these are uh, astrocytoma, these are cells of an astrocytoma. This is a glioma. We were creating primary cultures from patients. This is when I was at Ohio State University. And it has this beautiful artistic swirliness to it. It's always reminded me as I put in the background, uh, this picture from Van Gogh, uh, the, um, uh, just the way that the starry night, the uh, curves and the swirls of, uh, of that canvas. But as artistic as it might seem and as um, uh, benign as it, uh, artful as it might seem, these are absolutely terrible, awful tumors. Over here, I'll show you that you'll all realize that this is, or perhaps you will or should realize, that this is a slice of uh, what would be considered normal human cortex. This was taken from an epilepsy patient. Uh, and this was her temporal lobe. And you can see that there's a cytoarchitectural arrangement of uh, you know, layer one, layer two, layer three, going down to layer six, which is a hallmark of uh, hominid uh, cerebral evolution. In the slide or the picture above, this is a photomicrograph from a histological section of a glioblastoma that we removed. You can see all of that internal inherent architecture is, is destroyed. It's overrun by cells, and there is no native architecture that's present. And that's what gliomas do. They're diffuse and they're infiltrative. And that in part is really the problem on how to deal with them. I'd like to use this cartoon as a way to kind of give you my sense as a biophysicist, what I thought and how I thought about this tumor problem. For me, it's a biophysical problem. And it's a problem where the brain tumor, the glioma, is crawling along the brain. And I was wondering, how is it doing that? And we all knew that it was doing that probably because it was using inherent highways that are present in the brain. And those highways are the uh, axons. Those are the myelinated and unmyelinated axons that course throughout the brain. And so gliomas are often found in and along white matter tracks because that's how they spread. And a video that I have here of this uh, plays shows, again, this is uh, from when I was at Ohio State um, and uh, my lab, we would collect brain tumors from our patients and create primary cultures. And you can see that uh, the, there are cells in the background that are gobbling up these green dots. They're phagocytizing them. And they're really just kind of we use the green dots just as a way to highlight the cells, but you can really get the sense that these cells are moving. They're not staying still, they're not sessile, but they're actually absolutely motile. 
So this awful picture on a slide is what's actually going on in a patient's head. And that's why these tumors are so hard to defeat. One of the um, hallmarks that I learned a long time ago is the best way to answer a question is to have a good model. Uh, just like my dad was doing with mouse mammary tumor virus for breast cancer, I realized that I needed a model for understanding how these brain tumors were uh, behaving. And so in combination with uh, um, uh, biomedical engineering colleagues, again, this was at Ohio State, we created what we called race tracks. And we gave these tumor cells, which again, we harvested from our patients and put them in these troughs or tracks. And you can see how the cells don't necessarily uh, move in the middle, but they love these uh, guides or rails, which as you might imagine, are fundamentally akin to the white mitre fiber tracks. And the motions that they have and the movements and the engagements that they have are absolutely fascinating and clearly quite dynamic. And you can see that this is one of the hallmarks of the problem. Gliomas don't just sit still. They don't just replicate, but what they do is they migrate. Understanding uh, a problem and creating a better model was really a hallmark of much of my research for the last 15 years. And one of the things that we even did was we said, well, uh, brain tumors don't live in plastic dishes. They don't live um, on these kind of artificial racetracks. We actually said that, well, you know, the corpus callosum is that uh, incredible white matter fiber track that tumors often invade. Why don't we make a sort of very specialized uh, thin suture material that would be anywhere from 200 nanometers to uh, one micron and plate glioma cells on them and look at their, um, and look at their uh, migration along here. And you can see that these cells are all in a linear kind of format along the fiber tracks. I don't have this as a video, but I just wanted to show that what we were doing is trying to build better models to understand what's going on with these cells. Because if you can understand their behavior, maybe you can affect it and stop that behavior. Around this time, I think this is about 2010, I uh, changed positions and I was at a uh, Geisinger Medical uh, Center, which is in Danville, Pennsylvania. And I had really the privilege and benefit of, uh, again, having a lab and partnering with somebody who is the stem cell biology expert. And this was a time when it was quite clear that the glioma itself, while that is a problem, the real problem was the stem cell. And the stem cell is a cell that is pluripotent, difficult to eradicate, and the heart of the reason why, even when we, it looks like we have gotten the gross total resection in our patients, tumor still recurs because it's these highly resistant and resilient stem cells. Back then we switched from just taking patient tumors to purifying stem cells to get a more realistic model. And what we did here was, if you have a stem cell, you need to show that it's a stem cell. And I don't want to geek out on everybody, but there are some markers uh, called CD133 or Nestin that are generally uh, recognized markers for stem nests. And then if you have a stem cell, it's pluripotent. So that means it should be able to divide and create the lineage of cells that you would want to, uh, that it's supposed to uh, give rise to. For instance, if we stain with a neuronal marker, we can get neurons from a single cell, we can get uh, oligodendrocytes from a single cell, and we can get astrocytes. So it just shows and validates our model, and it shows that indeed stem cells that cause cancers also can create, um, they have a pluripotency, but it's the cancer part that's really their awful part. Here's a movie, uh, again, trying to build a better model. At this point in time, what we were doing is we were taking axons because up until then we were just looking at uh, artificial sort of axons or guides. These are uh, dorsal root ganglia rat axons, again, not human, and I understand that, but these axons have these cable-like properties as you can see, and our stem cells, which are highlighted in green and stained in green, you can see that they're invading into the mass of the axons and actually pulling them apart. And in this movie over here, if it doesn't take too long to play, you'll see that there's this axon right here, this single axon here, and then there's this glioma cell right here, and it will send out a process at some point in time and grab onto this axon and literally pull on it. And so you can imagine that this is the violence that's going on in a patient's head, and it's perhaps not surprising that they do so badly. 
Here's another video, uh, and I won't spend too much time on this, aside from the fact to show that we've got this alignment of axons. There are all these cables here, and we've got our glioma stem cells that we've harvested from our patients, and they're mostly outlined in green. Some of them are not. And you can see how this whole mass of axons are being pulled from one site to another. And you can see that in this time-lapse video over here where the axons were over here, and then they've been translated and migrated and pulled on by the gliomas. For what reason, who knows? But this is the action. This is uh, what gliomas are doing, and this is why they're causing this dysfunction. It's not that they're necessarily severing axons, but they're destroying the architectural integrity of the axons, and that's why our patients have their symptomatic presentations. At this point in time, we really realized, and this is about uh, uh, six years ago, that we had to come up with the best model that we could if we were going to understand what was going on with gliomas and if we we're going to understand how to stop gliomas. So this is a model I told you that we were using rat dorsal root uh, ganglia because they're easy to culture. And these are these beautiful hairs and fibers of the DRG, the rat uh, axons. We've put GFAP as a stain, and that stain are our uh, stem cells uh, from human tumors, human gliomas. And what we were doing here is to try to get human cells onto neurons or axons and ask what those interactions were. And more than that, we even went to the bold uh, uh, next step and said, well, let's go take those axons and myelinate them with oligodendrocytes. And then let's add axons, myelin, and tumors. And here you can see in uh, orange, these are our uh, cells that are migrating along. So we really uh, felt that we had to get the best model possible in order to answer the question most precisely. And the question is, how do you stop these cells? What's the halting signal? And that's really the thing. And the question is not necessarily can you eradicate the tumor, but is there a chance of taking GBM and turning it into, or transitioning it from a fatal disease into a disease that is chronic? And I don't mean to say that in a facetious way, but if you think about it, on average, if you're a GBM, uh, if you have a diagnosis of GBM and you have one of the more molecularly uh, poor prognostic diagnoses, a life expectancy is very short. It's probably only about 12 months with aggressive therapies that include surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy. So how do we, instead of say, well, we're going to try to do this massive cure, how do we contain the tumor? And in particular, as I hopefully have convinced you, how do we contain the spread? What's that stop signal? Well, again, using models and multiple models, we took uh, what are called rat organotypic cultures. And that's where you take a rat brain. Again, it's not a human brain, and I get that. And you make a slice, and we would add our stem cells onto those rat brains. And while you can't really see it here, these arrows represent the fact that the cells uh, of our glioma are just um, moving out into the parenchyma of this rat brain. And that's what glioma cells do, they migrate. But we found that there's a tyrosine kinase inhibitor um, through other means, and I won't get into that work, but I'm more than happy to discuss that with anyone offline. We found that there's a tyrosine kinase inhibitor that was very specific for glioma migration, and that if we would add stem cells here and then take away the mass so this tumors could percolate, and then added a uh, what we call um, an LCK, uh, which is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, we could stop cells from moving. And that was really, really, really profound. How did we uh, uh, really further validate this? Well, I'm a surgeon, I'm a stereotactic surgeon. And so what we did was we used an animal model. Again, animals are not humans and what you get from animals, you can't project necessarily fully to humans, but we felt that at this point in time, we needed an animal model. And the animal model here was a nude mouse. And the reason for having a nude mouse is because you need a mouse that has no 
innate immunity because the innate immunity could attack the cells. And then the results that you see are not necessarily the results of what you're doing, but it's just a, uh, a tissue rejection. So we would inject tumors, stem cells into mice and then insert an infusion pump. And you can see that we have, uh, this is sort of a uh, kind of a histologic set of um, uh, slides that are done stereotactically. And when we inject a tumor in one hemisphere of the mouse, you can see it almost fills up the whole hemisphere. But when we inject that tumor and then follow it with our tyrosine kinase inhibitor uh, that is being chronically uh, given to the uh, mouse, it's not killing the cells. We, you know, we, we don't have no cells here, but the migration has been curtailed. So you can imagine if we were to do a surgery locally here and also give that inhibitor, we might be able to deal with the bulk of the mass of the tumor and also deal with its uh, migration problems. And we were able to publish this uh, three years ago in uh, Oncogene. And it's really, really, I think, um, a, a nice set of um, thought experiments and work that uh, actually worked out. That takes me to, uh, as Peter mentioned, in 2019, I was really fortunate to have the opportunity to join Global Neuroscience. And in addition to the excellent care that I knew that my colleagues and partners uh, were able to provide at our uh, resident institutions, I was also very excited and interested to become a part of a research university again. Uh, and for instance, although I'm not going to go to this uh, hyperlink, uh, but if, um, if you're watching this slide or if you have it or we can give it to you, uh, in the Department of uh, Pharmacology and uh, Physiology, we've created something called a Translational Research and Core Expert Support Center, TRACES. And that means that for every tumor that we take out here now at uh, Crozier Chester Medical Center, there's a PhD literally 10 feet away from me in the OR that's taking that tumor tissue and taking it back to the lab and processing it right away. And so we're really very, very focused. Science. We, know a lot of, we, feel, we feel that the decision that we make is not only just doing the surgery, but then how do we take care of the problems that might account for their uh, demise? This is, for instance, a picture of one of our slides uh, um, that we harvested, or one of the slices that we harvested. These are human neurons. And these neurons, our, our project at Traces is so bold. We're taking tissue that's adjacent to uh, tumors. And so it's necessarily, it's got tumors in it, but it also has some normal brain uh, tissue in it. And we're taking those tissues and we're slicing them. We're making like 200 micron slices and we're keeping these brain organotypic cultures alive for up to three to four weeks. And we can see these beautiful viable axons and, um, and neurons. And we can then do studies on what it is about, I think the closest model to being in a person, uh, this ex vivo model of human CNS where we can do studies. And that's what we're doing uh, uh, through our partners in the pharmacology department. Equally, we're not limiting ourselves to what we have locally, but in Philadelphia, there is a wonderful organization called uh, the PC4C, the Philadelphia Coalition for Cure. And this includes institutions such as CHOP and Penn and Jefferson, but we are right there with them. And when we uh, harvest brain uh, tumors uh, or resect brain tumors, we send a part of that tissue to this consortium. And it's not a surprise that this consortium not only has the Liberty Bell prominently here to feature our region, but this circle of uh, double-stranded DNA. Because one of the goals, and I think this is where we will now transition in, our, in, the, in the talk, is to talk about how Definition and description of tumors up till now has been very visual. Um, they'll use terms like chicken wire or uh, palisading, but we're moving more into a molecular era. And I think uh, 
many of my neurosurgery colleagues and even uh, some of my uh, neurology colleagues will remember back to uh, medical school and their residencies where these kind of things were talked about. WHO, uh, the World Health Organization, grading such as grade one, which is a circumscribed lesion like a pilocytic astrocytoma, or you talk about grade two or grade three or grade four lesions. As you moved up in grade, you talked about uh, a description of what you saw and it wasn't necessarily absolute because it was your description as a pathologist. So for instance, uh, over here, you have this grade two astrocytoma. And what you can tell from normal brain is that the cellularity has increased and that's because there are infiltrating neoplastic cells and that you can see that the nuclei uh, if you're a pathologist, you can see that the nuclei are starting to become irregular. And so this would be a description of a grade two astrocytoma. Uh, if you move up in grade to a grade three astrocytoma, you'll see that not only are there more cells in here, but now the nuclei, for instance, have mitotic activity. And so that would be a characteristic for a grade three astrocytoma. And then when we got to what we call a glioblastoma, you would see that there are uh, descriptions of, first of all, there's increased cellularity, there's increased mitotic activity and bizarre uh, nuclear uh, and nuclei features, and this uh, necrosis or palisading, pseudopalisading necrosis. And that's something that we would then call a grade four astrocytoma. But, and, and just as a point of fact, uh, oligodendroglioma's were also defined that way, and, and they have these sort of like, uh, very homogeneous round cells and they'd have these blood vessels that would come through and they'd call it like chicken wire as a kid that grew up in the city, I never knew what chicken wire was. So it was always curious to me, but these are oligodendrogliomas. And the point I'm trying to make here is that it was a very visual, very descriptive, very uh, individual sort of based description of what they were seeing. This all really changed, I would say about 13 years ago when the uh, Cancer Genome Atlas Research Network, uh, as uh, any of you might see, the TCGA, which is intentional, it's a play on the uh, four nucleotides of the uh, genetic code. When the TCGA group released their first comprehensive analysis of tumors, and it was no surprise to me that they picked brain tumors because the problem really is an un daunting problem, or it is a daunting problem. And what they found here was a realization that the tumors were not only what they were pathologically or histologically, but what they were genetically. And maybe that should not be a surprise to us uh, today, but back then it really was. And one thing that shows up time and time again is IDH, isocitrate, uh, uh, IDH, isotrate dehydrogenase. And there's a story here, and this is what I'm going to lead into the molecular classification of gliomas. This um, paper came out about uh, two years after the TCGA, and they looked at this IDH, and they looked at the mutations in IDH. And they found that if you looked at low-grade lesions, such as what are called grade two or grade three lesions, or what are called secondary glioblastomas, which are tumors that presumably evolved from uh, lower grade lesions in younger people, about 85% of them had mutations in this uh, enzyme, IDH1 or two. Actually, most of them happen in IDH1, but IDH2 would happen as well. If you looked over here in that same report, less than 5% of primary glioblastomas had IDH mutants. And so we quickly realized that there's a marker here for um, pathogenicity. And that is what is now taking over the new uh, sort of description for histopathology. And that's what I'll show you in a moment. Out of curiosity, non-CNS tumors, namely say metastatic uh, tumors, they have no IDH mutants uh, or uh, they are all wild type. So this is a real clear cut sort of descriptor of what's happening in the brain. And just so you know, uh, I, everyone hates biochemistry or most people do, uh, IDH catalyzes this uh, oxidative decarboxylation of isocitrate 
to alpha ketic glutarate. There are cytoplasmic members and there are mitochondrial members. IDH1 is in the cytoplasm. And one of the uh, events that happens when IDH gets mutated is you can no longer uh, create alpha ketoglutarate, glutarate and you end up with this overabundance of 2-hydroxyglutarate. And that's actually, believe it or not, if uh, you're at an institution where they do uh, uh, MR spectroscopy, you can actually look for this peak of 2-hydroxyglutarate and then make a prediction, even preoperatively, as to whether this is a uh, IDH mutant uh, tumor or not. And you'll see why that becomes such a big deal, because it has a big deal to do with longevity, prognosis, and survival. And so now, instead of saying these are glioblastomas or GBMs, even though we will colloquially, colloquially use that term, really these are diffuse gliomas. And the one first thing that happens is you say, okay, you've got a brain tumor. We think it's an intrinsic intraaxial tumor. Is there an IDH mutation? And if there is an IDH mutation, you go down this one pathway. You ask the next question, is there a set of codeletions in 1P19Q? These are genetic loci. And I know I, I promise I wouldn't get into alphabet soup, but there's a little bit that's required. If you are co-deleted in 1P19Q, then you are by definition what's called an oligodendroglioma, which in a way is wonderful because that absolutely has a better prognosis. If you are not co-deleted, then you are an astrocytoma. And in prior um, sort of parlance, this would have been considered GBM, but now we're just going to call it an astrocytoma or diffuse astrocytoma IDH mutant, as opposed to if you have no mutation, then you just are called astrocytoma IDH wild type, which is what we would consider uh, the old term for glioblastoma multiforme. This might be a way of, uh, and I'll be wrapping up soon enough uh, to allow for questions, but this might be a better way of seeing this. Histology gets the tumor they're going to call it a diffuse glioma. The question is going to be, is IDH mutated or not? If IDH is mutated, you go down one pathway. If IDH isn't mutated, you call it a diffuse astrocytoma IDH wild type. If IDH is mutated and 1P19Q are not co-deleted, then it's a diffuse astrocytoma IDH mutant. So we've gotten away from grade four, GBM, we've gotten to a point where we're more descriptive with the molecular mechanisms that are underlying these tumors in their biology. And then as I was mentioning to you, uh, just to uh, top it off, if you are co-deleted in 1P19Q, then you are by definition an oligodendroglioma, which is a much better diagnosis. Uh, I don't wanna get into all of those nuances. I just wanted to bring up the fact that we've gone from what we used to call uh, glioblastoma multiforme, and many of us still do that through uh, descriptive diagnostic histologic uh, identifiers of these tumors to becoming more and more molecular and more and more pinpoint. The reason why IDH makes such a difference is in this slide. And there's another thing, I'm not going to throw too much into it, it's called uh, methylation of uh, MGMT, which is an enzyme that your body produces that uh, can either counteract the effect of one of the main chemotherapeutics that we use in uh, brain tumors. If you have a methylated uh, MGMT, that means that you will likely be suppressed in your ability to stop the chemotherapeutic, means the chemotherapeutic will be more efficacious. So patients who are unmethylated in MGMT, and I know now I'm going through a lot of alphabet soup, and our IDH wild type, you can see over here, they do terrible. This is the standard GBM survival curve, maybe 5% at five years, which is fairly miserable. Patients that are the best, meaning, met, meaning mutated in IDH and methylated in MGMT, their survival's 
or in the order of years, which is really, really uh, pretty profound. There are other things that happen and that we can talk about at another point in time about what are the latest technologies for uh, survival or prolonging survival in glioma patients, but just these molecular diagnostics are what are making the difference. So before, when we used to put this all into one big pool, we were losing the uh, distinction of the, uh, of the separate populations that are here. Unfortunately, these uh, IDH mutant uh, players uh, that are uh, hypermethylated are only about 15% of the population. So while finding this is, is wonderful for patients, most of our patients are in this 85% where their tumors are uh, aggressive and bad. I think I'll leave with uh, uh, these final thoughts and that is that how do we get better at brain tumor biology and how do we get better at understanding the uh, the nuances of brain tumor biology and stopping these cancers from being um, fatal to being chronic. Uh, Anastasia is a uh, person that I met. Uh, she uh, was the communications and social media director for uh, the Warren campaign just recently. And Anastasia is one of those unfortunate uh, younger patients in her 20s that had a GBM. And you can see here she is uh, in the hospital. And she wrote an article uh, this year, I think it was in the spring, uh, about how COVID vaccine uh, was basically all resources were mobilized for COVID vaccine. And she wants that same kind of uh, zeal and effort to be channeled uh, into curing cancers like hers, which is a high-grade brain tumor. And so I think it's going to take advocacy on the part of patients uh, and uh, their loved ones and science and intelligence on the part of our researchers uh, in order to make uh, this cancer something that we can say we're proud that we've been able to stop. And that's something that I think we're uh, poised to do at uh, GNI. And so I'll really leave you with this brain in the bottle. Typically, I used to say that the brain in the bottle meant my day was done, but now I realize more and more that the brain in the bottle means that, yes, my day is done for that patient, but really that's when all the work starts because this is when the science starts. So with that, Peter, I'd like to thank you for uh, allowing me to have uh, the inaugural uh, uh, Grand Rounds presentation. Uh, thank you everyone out there for uh, taking uh, some of your uh, Friday uh, morning and I'll take any questions if you have any. Uh, Adam, thank you. That's a really great talk and, you know, fascinating videos. I, um, you know, I wish we were, you know, it wasn't the cancer cells that was yeah. the fascinating yes. part of exactly. it, but, you, exactly. know, that, you know, the bad part is the fascinating part when you look at it. So um, there are some questions um, we have from the audience. Um, what do you know about the, what can you tell us about the uh, risk factors for developing diffuse gliomas? Right. So right, right now, yes. yeah. So you know, there, everyone makes uh, things about, say, cell phones and things like that. Pretty much, we can say cell phones don't do that, or mm -hmm. electromagnetic radiation doesn't do that. But there are some genetic syndromes, uh, Life Hermani, Lynch syndrome. There are some syndromes, but overwhelmingly, gliomas. Just like people think, forget in breast cancer, only ten percent of breast cancers are familial. The overwhelming majority of breast cancers are spontaneous. And that's the same thing here. The overwhelming majority of gliomas are spontaneous. So there really are no, say, risk factors per se. It's, it's a world, you know, fascinating thing with, with, with the cancers because, you know, ideally we, our cells are, you know, tend to, you know, do everything to keep the host alive. Yes. The cancer, it goes <laughs> the other way around, just kills the host, you know, and kills themselves. But um, another question is, what is, is uh, what is known about immune system role in the glioma formation or glioma containment? Yeah, and, and that's a really, really good question because believe it or not, all these uh, uh, PDL uh, and checkpoint inhibitors are being used now as trials for uh, GBM. It's not clear whether it'll work or not. The brain tends to be an immune privileged site. Although uh, for certain, we know that once tumors uh, invade that some of that privilege breaks down, but that is actually an active form of research. And there are trials that are foregoing what is standard uh, chemotherapy and using these checkpoint inhibitors or these um, uh, immunologics. Sure. Now you were, um, you explained uh, very eloquently this, you know, and uh, the classification of diffuse gliomas. 
depending on, on a specific mutation. So does that command different treatment? Uh, well, at the moment, it really um, commands what we can say to our patients, what their life expectancy will be. We don't really have, say, a um, like a, a, a landscape of saying, oh, you're P53 mutated, or you've got EGFR or uh, epidermal growth factor receptor mutation that we can further confer how to um, target your treatment. So while it would sound like it should be, at the moment we're hampered there, we, we don't know. It's more that we're looking back, we're stepping back, we're saying, oh, you're IDH mutated, you have uh, hypermethylation of this one gene, uh, MGMT, great, fantastic, will be very aggressive. Uh, whereas if you were IDH wild type, maybe you're 80 years old, you're unmethylated, uh, maybe it's just a way of saying, let's not subject you to all the rigors of uh, chemotherapy because chemotherapy is not benign and it has its own set of consequences. Now, what is your personal opinion? If you have to choose, what would be the the target or the method of treatment that would bring the most the big, the, be, the best results in the future for the you know treatment or cure of the of the gliomas? Yeah, so I think that the targets and treatments, uh, like I've sort of evolved in my own uh, research, have been uh, trying to target stem cells because stem cells are the problem. We can eradicate, uh, we can make the uh, MRI look great, but we know for a fact that there are stem cells that are lurking. And that's what happened, uh, you know, almost 100 years ago when Walter Daniel would take out half the brain and patients would still succumb to their disease because then it would infect or elaborate itself in the, in the, in the opposite hemisphere. So treating stem cells, targeting that, and that's what we're looking at, and targeting, I think, migration are what we, what I personally feel is how tumors will be um, not, not cured, Peter, but kept in a chronic fashion. And that's that's what my research focuses on. Sure. Something like an analogy to HIV, you know, it's-, it's Yes, like exactly, 100%, 100%. Uh, the, now, there are a couple of questions about the, uh, the, uh, when it comes to treatment. When mapping, mapping for tumor surgery, uh, which areas do you guys are usually trying to spare, if possible? Yeah, so uh, obviously, so uh, it's a funny term, but we use, everyone thinks of the brain as being this in incredibly uh, uh, hands-off uh, uh, organ. Obviously, as neurosurgeons, it's what we put our hands on just about every day. Uh, and because of that, we have come up with some terms that might sound a little bit funny, but we have eloquent areas and non-eloquent areas. And so, for instance, if the tumor is in an area that we feel would be eloquent, like speech or motor control, uh, then we might um, stimulate them uh, in one fashion or another, either in the operating room, which sounds um, uh, scary. It is to patients, but we know how to get them through it. Or we can do it outside the operating room where we place electrodes and grids in those patients, allow them to stabilize, get them out into our ICUs, and then test them very, very uh very, very um, finely and understand, oh, this spot is speech, but this spot is not, or this spot is sensation, but this spot is not. And that's a really, really wonderful way of trying to get the greatest amount of maximal resection. And that's something per perhaps you would do in somebody that's a IDH mutant, where you know that if you can take out a greater bulk of uh, tumor, you know that they already have a good prognosis and you can help their prognosis that way. Sure. Um, I know that GNI is involved in the intra-arterial treatment, the uh, mm -hmm. deliver of the medication you know, to the tumor. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Well, sure, absolutely. So the intra-arterial treatment, I mean, we're really fortunate at GNI. We have uh, five uh, endovascular uh, and open vascular neurosurgeons. And uh, Avastin uh, is one way of treating these tumors. It was first thought that it would be the way of treating all tumors because it was a way of uh, sort of uh, imagining that you would uh, starve the tumor of its blood supply. The problem with gliomas are if they've got a good pedicle, then I think all my uh, endovascular colleagues can easily uh, target this. But if you have a tumor that's so diffuse, and, and, uh, and that's the thing that I highlight uh, and harp on so many times, unfortunately, sometimes we don't have the opportunity to find tumors at an early enough point in time. But I think that, uh, for instance, Dr. Bez is uh, 
done at least two patients, if I'm not mistaken, on that trial this year. And both of them, if I'm also not mistaken, had really, really dramatic results. So we're getting patients from all over for a variety of different reasons, either for our um, open studies for, say, Avastin, or patients that are here locally because they're contributing to the two different IRB studies that we have. We kind of have time for one more question that just came in. An increase in tumors in post-COVID patients that you would be aware of. Hey, you know, we haven't seen that. It's, it's not, uh, there, there are always these thoughts about uh, what is COVID doing. Um, we haven't seen that, but equally we haven't seen, uh, it, just to bring back a point that you were talking about, Peter, there's not per se an increase of tumors in HIV patients. And we know that HIV affects the brain and it affects immunity. So that's, um, that's a reasonable question, but I, I don't think that there's really any good data that says that COVID is a Predistribute or uh, you know uh, gives you a preponderance or a likelihood of having any kind of tumor, whether it's metastatic or primary. Adam, thank you very much. It was a great, great talk, and I, I, uh, I'm getting a lot of you know positive feedback here in the in, in the chat. And Adam, thank you very much. And I thank you, thank you, everyone. In uh, two weeks. Bye bye.